Good morning, LaSalle, and those of you joining us as part of the larger beloved community of faith. We are super excited that you've chosen to join us today above all other days. And I guarantee you that this is the absolute best day you could have ever decided to be with us. It's a day unlike any other day in our earthly existence. While there are plenty of days that are etched into the core of our memory, like birthdays and holidays and special occasions, to name a few, this day outweighs them all. You may say, but Pastor Randall, what about that day in 1886 when the doors of this church first swung open to welcome the working class Swedes who pooled their resources together to erect this edifice? And I would say, nope, that day pales in comparison to this day. Someone else may say, but Pastor, what about December 1st, 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama? Surely the day that Rosa Parks decided not to give up her seat was more important than this day. I agree, that was an important and transformative day, but still no match at all for this day. I can even hear someone saying, but what about November 9th, 1989, the day the Berlin Wall came down? Nope, not at all, no correlation whatsoever to this day. And then I can hear one of the old news buffs say, well, what about February 11th, 1990? Everyone cherishes that day as a day to remember. Nope, not even the release of Nelson Mandela from South African prison is remotely similar to this day. This day was the pinnacle to every other day prior and every other day since. Metaphorically speaking, this was the World Series of Baseball, the Super Bowl of football, and the day that provided power, intimate relationship, and foresight for all who were willing to receive. Therefore, with the time allotted to me today, I would like to use as a subject from which to preach the day that changed the game. This day was a day like no other. And what happened on this day would remain closer than any brother. The plan was set before the beginning of time. It required rhythm and it definitely required rhyme. A triune console preceded the plan. And once the deal was cut, it could be stopped by no man. The father sent the son to walk among humankind, a three year journey inclusive of turning water into wine. This way and that way and that way and this, the son's obedience brought the father great bliss. The son loved the father and the father the son, but when death came knocking, the father would compromise none. Crying from the garden, the son pleaded to have this cup taken away, but the father knew if that happened, earth could never experience this day. 39 stripes the son endured without a sigh. It was quite a price to pay, but he did it for you and I. He did it so we could have greater access to truth and not be subject to spiritual heretics gone aloof. If the stripes weren't enough, things got even more rough. A crown of thorns pressed into his head and an old rugged cross laid on his back like a bed. His accusers laughed and said, we've got him now. But his father looked down and said, oh, really? How? The persecutors saw the son through a glass darkly, but his father saw his only begotten through the light sharply. And when the time came to nail him to the tree, the son resisted I, but insisted on we. On either side hung criminals by nature. But the son saw forgiveness and the criminals received favor. Paradise was part of the ultimate plan, but the son would only go with his new friends in hand. It was there that the son released his last breath, but though it was his last, it didn't mean death. Two days he laid, but on the third day he rose, only to continue the journey the triune council had chose. Consistent with the foretold plan, the son met his disciples prior to releasing the promise no one could understand. 
For 40 days, they conversed from time to time. But on one occasion, the son instructed, wait here until you receive the promised sign. I've told you about this before, he said. I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire instead. When the day had finally come, the disciples were gathered together as one. The son rejoined his triune family and the moment was set to release the promise quickly. Suddenly, the promise did not delay a clo as cl and cloven tongues of fire consumed the day. Not one was left out of this heavenly clout, but some still wondered, what is this all about? The Holy Spirit provided utterance, but the people had to give it a voice. For the promise is available to everyone, but receiving the promise is a choice. New language, new power, new relationship and foresight. The majority of those gathered spoke well into the night. The birth of the church was now a flame, and these first parishioners would never be the same. Because this was the day that changed the game. Sisters and brothers, I submit to you that that day is this day, and this day is that day. The game I speak of is the one we refer to as the game of life. Metaphorically speaking, it's the daily grind of successfully getting around the annual board game of day to day living, collecting your two hundred dollars when you pass go without having to succumb to the pitfalls the avenues of life have to offer. If there was ever a time when we needed to benefit the benefit of the Holy Spirit's release in Palestine over two thousand years ago, it's absolutely right now. From that time until this very moment, life has taught us individually, collectively and unequivocally that apart from God, we can do nothing. But with God, nothing shall be impossible unto us. Our text today informs us that this day lit a match in the life of the church that though it only warmed a small number of gatherers to start, the flame eventually spread like wildfire throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and like an inferno to all the ends of the earth. The receiving and empowering of the Holy Spirit that day enabled this courageous and embryonic band of urban preachers to teach, heal, and demonstrate unconditional love in synagogues, schools, homes, marketplaces, courtrooms, street corners, hillsides, and even desert roads. Wherever God sent them by his spirit, lives, systems, and history were changed. The manner in which these servants of antiquity received and allowed the Holy Spirit to foster, foster inclusivity, break down barriers, and bring God's will to pass can teach you and I a lot about changing the game within our homes, our cities, and throughout all the ends of the earth. But if we are to allow the Holy Spirit to change the game of lives, systems, and history through us as in, antiqui as in antiquity, we must be honest and ask ourselves individually and as the church, which game are we playing and who is the umpire? Are we receiving and working with the Holy Spirit? Or are we just enjoying an obligatory Sunday morning form of godliness, but denying the power thereof? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to be the umpire of our hearts who changes our language to the benefit of every race, creed and nationality in our existence? Or are we overtly and covertly in agreement with the divisive spirit of hate that is seemingly saturating not only our world, but also the church. Right now, there are large sectors of the church, the church, cross wearing and bearing disciples that seek to divide based on mendacious personalities and propaganda without regard to the fact that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And the faith needed to receive and work with the Holy Spirit only works by love. 
And whenever love gives way to hate, faith is paralyzed and Satan initiates all forms of confusion, not because of perceived or granted power, but rather because we individually and collectively to a large degree have decided to take matters into our own hands without regard for the fact that the God that we serve is not the author of confusion, but rather of peace. Which game are we playing and who is the umpire? A closer examination of the text reveals what happens when we become receptive to the fire of God and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. Here in chapter two of Dr. Luke's description of the day that changed the game, referred to as the day of Pentecost, God poured out the Holy Spirit on everyone present and no one was left out. The person in Inglewood is just as important as the person in the Gold Coast. The person without a home is just as important as the person with three homes. The person in the row houses is just as important as the person in the Ritz Carlton. The Johnson family is just as important as the royal family. And the person sitting on death row awaiting execution is just as important as the newly formed embryo in the womb whose heart has just beat for the first time. People of God, it does not matter where you are from, how long you've been there, where you're going, or how long it takes you to get there. The Holy Spirit knows how to change the language and the game to meet you where you are. Because the Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God is no respecter of persons and neither should we be. Our only job is to be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit. And when we are, we too will exercise power to function in the capacity to change the game, not only for our lives, but also for the lives around us. Receiving and being open to the Holy Spirit is what the original triune plan that I spoke about earlier was all about. The ultimate desire of heaven is for you and I, the church, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to change lives, systems and history, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It should not be that we allow the status quo to simply exist all around us while we file in and out of church on a weekly basis as if it is just the way it is, becoming complicit with mediocrity as opposed to being explicit with the power of Jesus. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. You see, the Holy Spirit represents our front line of defense against Satan and Satan's devices. This is why and where Satan fights against the Holy Spirit the most. And it's a fight not fought by secular society, but rather by those sitting in the pews of churches due to misunderstanding, fleshly manipulation, and an unwillingness to let go and let God. But the good news is that that day is this day and this day is that day. Every day, hour, minute, and second of our lives is another opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit afresh and anew, willing to fulfill God's will in earth, even as it is in heaven. And like the first recipients of God's Spirit on the day of Pentecost, you will be misunderstood. But it's the divine price of humility you must be willing to pay based, on, based upon the sacrificial price that Jesus paid for us. Our good friend Paul Hedinger reminds us just about every post-service Zoom call that our God is a God of multiple chances. Therefore, there's never a time when God will leave you nor forsake you or loose his hold upon you because God's love is always bigger than your problem, taller than your mountain and wider than the sea of your mistakes. Black, white, yellow, brown, purple, blue, or pink, the Holy Spirit has signed your name in the book of life 
with the same red ink. What game are you playing and who is the umpire? When you choose to play the game of life according to the plan and dictates of the Holy Spirit, systems will begin to change in your favor and for God's purpose. Right after the first infilling of the Holy Spirit, the system or manner in which the early church conducted themselves, life and services changed drastically. The more they availed themselves to the Holy Spirit, the more the multiple ministries of the Holy Spirit began to manifest in their lives and the systems of life surrounding them. No longer were they only subject to their own physical abilities and proclivities, but now they had complete access to the Holy Spirit as comforter and counselor in times of severe need, as the spirit of truth to discern their way through difficult decisions and situations. As a personal teacher of all things, included in and excluded from the Bible. As a personal reminder to bring all things to their remembrance that Jesus has spoken directly to them. And to remind them of verses of scripture spoken in God's word. The Holy Spirit provides access to the identical peace that Jesus walked in that made him unmanageable by Satan. The Holy Spirit will always convince the world of sin, affirm the world of authentic righteousness and alert the world of any oncoming judgment. The ministry of the Holy Spirit provides personal and collective leadership and guidance through the murky waters of life and revealed things to these early believers before they manifested, just to name a few. Let me give you a perfect example. I'll never forget that during the time I was working news here in the city of Chicago, a former neighbor of mine was in law school and lived in an apartment building right next door to LaSalle. Every Friday evening for approximately a year, I would sit right outside the 1140 apartment building in the little parking cove that's still there to this day and wait for him to come out so that I could give him a ride to his parents' house. It wasn't until I landed an interview for this job and I was searching for a parking place when I passed by the 1140 apartment building and was immediately reminded of the time and realized that God had been preparing me for 23 years prior for this very moment. Tears began to rush down my face as I sat in the car preparing to meet with Dave Neely and stepped foot in Cornerstone Center for the very first time. Whenever we choose to surrender our will and play the game of life according to the plan and dictates of the Holy Spirit, we will always be successful. It will be difficult at times and you will not always understand the Holy Spirit's direction or method because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But if you are willing to endure hardness as a good kingdom soldier, you will not allow yourself to become entangled with the affairs of this everyday life, but rather you will only desire to please the umpire that enlisted you and welcomed you into the game of life to begin with. And finally, sisters and brothers, when we choose to play the game of life according to the plans and dictates of the Holy Spirit, we can change the course of history forever, just as these early preachers and parishioners did. How you successfully play the game of life ultimately depends on who your umpire is. I'm often reminded of Nelson Mandela, who sat in South African prison for 27 long, hard, and humiliating years. But through it all, he allowed the Holy Spirit to change his language, break down barriers, and change the course of history forever. Once after he was elected as the president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela was having lunch along with his security guards at a restaurant. Everyone placed their orders and were chatting while they waited for their food. 
At that moment, Mandela spotted a man sitting across from his table, also waiting for his food. He told his guards to ask that man to join them for lunch. The man agreed and joined them, but sat quietly the whole time. After waiting for some time for their food, their food had arrived and everyone relished on the delicious meal. The man too started eating, but his hands were trembling without uttering a word. He quietly ate his food and left. Everyone could sense that something was fishy. So after he left, his guards guessed that he might have been ill because he was trembling so bad. To this, Nelson Mandela shook his head and said that he knew that man. He was the jailer at the prison on Robben Island, where Mandela was in prison. This was the jailer that gave him a very tough time while he was there, subjecting him to all kinds of torture. In fact, this was the jailer who ordered him to dig and then climb into a grave-shaped trench in the prison yard. And he, as he laid in the dirt, the jailer unzipped his pants and proceeded to urinate on him. But things were different now, and Mandela had become president of South Africa. So when he invited him over to join them for lunch, the man thought that Mandela might seek revenge and behave the same way that he did. But Mandela did no such thing, because he believed that no matter what the person did to him, it is not in his character to harm others. He believes that the burning feeling of revenge and angst will only cause destruction, whereas patience and tolerance are the tools that can help develop compassion and humility amongst us. Sisters and brothers, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Mandela says, and I quote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of her or his skin, background or religion. People must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. You see, in the history of the church, this is the day that makes every other day matter. Because of what happened on this day, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is also able to raise us up, no matter what stage of life we find ourselves in. For the spirit of the Lord God is upon us because he's anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent us to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Preaching not done with words, but rather with living. The life you preach is more potent than the words you speak. Why? Because this is the day that changed the game, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in prayer. Ah, gracious and merciful God, we are your people and you are indeed our God. You are the God of all life and all existence. And so I now lift those that are under the sound of my voice to you. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would cause them to receive the Holy Spirit afresh and anew today in earth even as it is in heaven. And I say, oh breath, you come. You come like a mighty rushing wind and you blow life into every person that can hear my voice right now. And let this be the very best day of the rest of their lives. Because on this day, they've received the Holy Spirit afresh and anew. God, we thank you for filling us with the knowledge of your will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we might walk worthy unto you, unto all pleasing, that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened, to know the hope 
of the calling that you've called us to through Christ Jesus. We don't ask these prayers in our name, but we ask them in the name of our soon coming King. We ask these prayers in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, as you listen to this song, I want you to welcome the Holy Spirit into your heart. And I promise you that this day will change the game. And we lift our hearts. 